Well, we are excited to kick off a new series here at TPHOC, and um, I, I get excited about everything new. Um, if you're familiar with Enneagram, I'm an Enneagram 7, so anything that's like new and fun and now I'm about, all right? So I love new beginnings, and another thing about me is that I love church. I'm a church kid. I was raised, yes, got some church folk up in here, yes. And I, I just, I, I don't have to be invited to go to church. I don't have to um, uh, seek it out. It's just something that I want to do. It's something I love doing. It's a place I want to be. I was raised in church. I know that's not everyone's story, but bear with me because there is a downside to being raised in church. Um, we have this thing, um, it's a language. I, I actually call it Christianese. Does anyone know what Christianese is? Some of y'all are bilingual in here, where we say things like, how are you? Blessed. God is good all the time. And see, y'all speak Christianese too, right? So we come in and we have this like Christian language sometimes. And I want to be mindful of that because I don't want people to feel precluded or excluded from this community. I also know that the downfall with that is that sometimes we love to testify the goodness of God. How many of you guys know that we love a good testimony? And here at TFHOC, we are a church that's passionate about transformation. We love people's lives being transformed. We love telling stories of transformation. It's who we are, it's in our DNA, it's what we love. Now, the downfall on that is that sometimes we can have stories of what we used to be. Oh, I used to embezzle funds. I used to cheat at school. I used to cheat on my wife. I used to have an addiction. I used to drink too much. I used to, and then we say, and then I met God and he transformed my life. And we say yes and amen. Yes. Hallelujah. We celebrate that. But the downfall is that we only talk, if we only talk about the transformation back then, it doesn't allow space and grace for us to talk about what we're experiencing now. Like where we can come and have an honest conversation about the things that are affecting us now. What are we struggling with now? Why are we so afraid to have these conversations and open up our hearts and our minds? I think sometimes it's because of shame. We don't want to admit to people where we are now. Yeah. We're kicking off a new series entitled Ish. Uh -huh. Some of y'all get me. <laughs> I'm in the house of God, so I got to watch my words because my mama's going to watch this. But this series is entitled Ish, Issues We Don't Want to Talk About. Yeah. And the reason why is because here at this community, we don't, we, we don't shy away from tough conversations. And you know where we're going to land? We don't have to agree to be family. Uh -huh. And you, I'm not going to sit here and try to convince you to change your mind. I'm simply going to preach the word of God unabashedly. I'm going to live by the word of God. And I love you so much that if you don't agree with me, we still family. Oh, that doesn't exist. That doesn't happen. We all have to think alike and vote alike and be alike. No, 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 no. Because we all have that crazy uncle that comes up on Thanksgiving. We don't really like him, but he's family. You know what I'm saying? We all got crazy family. We don't have to agree to be family. Now, we're kicking off this series in, in, intentionally, and I'm going to let you know right from the get-go what we're going to jump into. Because um, the topic that I'm talking about today, it actually, I didn't know I was going to talk about this. I didn't think it was going to be that big of an issue. But I realized there's some ish around this issue. And what I realized that over the next six weeks, we're going to be talking about issues of our heart. Uh -huh. Issues of our heart. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the issue of gossip. And I say that from the get-go because when we think about issues we don't want to talk about, we're going to talk about racism. We're going to talk about gender roles. We're going to talk about uh, God's sovereignty. Why do bad things happen to good people? We're going to be having these conversations. Why start on gossip? Uh -huh. Because... A church can survive a moral failure. A church could survive even embezzlement. But you know what church can't survive? A split from gossip. In fact, there's not a lot of things that God, if it's listed in the Bible, that God hates. Do you know that one of them is gossip? God hates gossip. And I feel like before we even talk about any of these other topics that we're going to address over the next couple of weeks, we have to be fully aware that gossip is a thing that can destroy. In fact, this is the difference between murder and gossip. If you murder somebody, they're gone. But if you kill their, their integrity, if you kill their identity, they have to live in the wake of that forever. Gossip is dangerous. Gossip is, 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 is horrible. God actually says that he hates gossip. And so I'm from um, L.A., born and raised, and I want to bring a little bit of street cred to Orange County, okay? Because some of y'all want to wear Dodgers hats, and you haven't even been to Chavez Ravine, okay? <laughs> Don't try to appropriate L.A. culture. You've never even been there, okay? Rather die Lakers. Have you been to Staples Center? Uh-uh, okay? So I'm going to bring a little L.A. swag with some O.C. flavor today. The title of today's message is Keeping It G. 
all right? Yeah. Some of y'all know like that and you're gonna say, oh, keeping it G, like a movies that are rated for everyone. No, 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 I'm talking about keeping it gangster. That's right, thank you, Coco, yes. Keeping it G, keeping it gangster means I see you, like knows like, real knows real, and I'm gonna show you respect. I wanna keep it real today because I want us to respect each other enough that we stop talking trash about our brothers and sisters, amen? All right, so as we dive into scripture, I first feel like we need to lay a foundation of what gossip is. We gotta be on all the same page. So by definition, which is on the screen, gossip is casual or unrestrained conversation or reports about other people, typically involving details that are not confirmed as being true. <laughs> so why don't we wanna talk about this problem? Why, why don't we think that it's a big deal? Because let me tell you something, the effects of gossip are not just damaging, they're damning. Um, two years ago, I discovered that I am 1% Jewish. So I'm gonna tell you a story from a rabbi that I know. A woman went up to her rabbi and she said, Rabbi, I think I have sinned against my, 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 my neighbor. I've spoken ill and I've spoken slander. I've gossiped about this man. And the rabbi says, okay, well, what do you need? She said, I need to know what to do. He says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to get a pillow, cut it open, and release all the feathers in the city center and then come back and see me. So she goes to the city center, she opens the pillows, the feathers go everywhere, she goes back to her rabbi and she says, Rabbi, I've done as you said. And he said, great, what I want you to do now is to go and pick up every single feather around the city. And she said, oi vey, what am I supposed to do? The feathers are everywhere. And he said, exactly, that's the effect of gossip. You have no idea where things end up or how it'll affect people. Do you know that from the beginning of the Bible, in the book of Exodus and Leviticus, scripture is very clear about the effects of gossip. And then all, all the way to the New Testament, to the book of James, and James says, don't call yourself a Christian if you can't keep your mouth shut. That's the BIV version. Yeah. He will say, bridle your tongue. I'm going to say, keep your mouth shut, all right? So James is saying, you can't say that you're a Christian if you're going to talk trash about people and you don't know how to keep your mouth closed. So from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we aren't to bear a false witness. What does that mean? Don't talk trash about people. In fact, this is so serious. In Psalm 101, verse 5, it says this. Whoever slanders their neighbor secretly, he will destroy. God is going to destroy people that talk trash? Yo, this ish is serious. That's why I want to start here. And if you don't believe me, then trust the wisdom from my wise uncle, King Solomon. Now, King Solomon is known as one of the wisest men in the Western world. And that's not just for Christian history. I'm talking about secular history. He has this book, it's called Proverbs, and it's rich with history. This book of Proverbs is so rich with history, it gives us actually practical handles for how to live our life. Check out on the screen what he says about gossip. He says in chapter 10, verse 18, whoever conceals hatred with lying lips and spreads slander, what's that? That's trash, that's gossip, is a what, church? That's right, is a fool. They're foolish. Messy, sloppy. Look at chapter 11, verse 13. A gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy person keeps a secret. Bless God. That's a good friend. Chapter 18, 21. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it ooh, will eat its juicy, sweet summer fruit. Look at verse uh, 19 out of chapter 20. A gossip betrays confidence. Listen, if they talk to you, they will talk about you, period, all right? Look at chapter 26, verse 17. Whoever meddles in a quarrel that is not their own is like someone who takes a passing dog by the ears. What happens when you grab a dog by the ears that don't know you? You get bit, all right? Don't act surprised when people come for you. Now, maybe you're sitting here thinking like, oh, little old me, I don't gossip. Clutch my pearls. I'm just going to sit here and listen. I, th this, is, this, is for, this is for Sister Sally who needs to hear this word. You don't think it deals with you. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. I think that we think that gossip looks a particular way. It's like one way. And bad people do it. Non-Christian people do it. But see, within Christianity, we're going to tell on ourselves today, within Christianity, gossip takes different forms. So as I was preparing for this message, I sat there. I'm like, what are different forms of gossip that permeate our life? Maybe you know this type of gossiper. I've listed them, the power tripper. Now these people, they love to have information. They love to have information because information is power. So what they'll say is, I have this information that I can tell you. Let me tell you what I know. Basically, let me tell you what I know that you want to know that I know so you know I'm in the know. And then I'm gonna tell you what I know. They use it as information, but it's really gossip. The power tripper. What about the hater? What about the hater? 
These people, these, these people, they just love to tell on other people to feel better about themselves. I'm going to push you down so I can walk over you and look better for me. I'm going to not make it about you so I could talk about me. That's the hater. So we have the power tripper. We got the hater. Who else do we see? Oh, oh, the processor. This is a good one. These are the people uh, that they don't believe that they're gossiping. Um, they're simply, simply processing their emotions. They are gaining feedback and insight from other people. Well, this is what I heard. So let me go ahead and share this with you because I'm processing my emotions. Now, maybe you still don't think that you've ever seen someone who's a processing gossiper. Well, within Christianity, we call it the prayer request. Oh, oh, you know what? I need you to pray with me. We, we need to pray for Steve. Oh, why do we need to pray for Steve? Well, Steve's been hanging out with Stephanie, and we know that she's a new Christian. You can tell by the way she dresses, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, so we need to pray for them because they're real flirty. Wait a minute. Uh, isn't, isn't Brother Steve married? I uh, know, but you didn't hear from me that they're getting divorced. So let's pray. Let's pray for them. Let's pray for them. Let's pray that the enemy doesn't come and, you know, have them be closer than we already see they are, sitting in church, worshiping next to each other, raising holy hands, leave room for the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Let's pray. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. We should lift up his marriage. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. The processor. Yeah. Or what about the last form of gossiping that I've noticed is, is lightning rod. Now, these are the people that are saying, I don't go around gossiping. These people just talk to me about it. Like, I'm just, I'm just a good listening ear. Let me make it real clear. There's a reason for that. There's a reason why they feel safe in your company. See, they, see, they could see you, smell you. They could sense that you are as thirsty and as mean and ill-willed as they are. They know that you'll agree with them. They know that you will validate their unjustified uh, 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 opinions and you will say, I co-sign on that. You know what? That is right. You should feel angry. Oh, can you believe? My father has affectionately referred to these types of people as wound lickers. Wound lickers. Um, cats are, are wound lickers. Now, I know some of y'all are cat people. We're going to do a salvation message at the end so that you can get saved. <laughs> cats are of the devil, all right? But cats are our wound lickers. So they, they, woo, they, they lick each other's wounds, and something that's licked repeatedly doesn't heal. So these people are lightning rods. Well, they'll sit there and co-sign repeatedly to have an injustice happen again and again and again. Those people, they could smell your discontent. So why do we love gossip? If gossip's so bad, why do we love it? For the same reason we love reality TV. Do you know that reality TV was built upon the premise of inciting gossip after you watch the shows. The point of reality TV, this is science. I don't know, ask Pastor Matt, he was the one who told me. That as, scientifically speaking, these shows were invented so that it would incite a sense of gossip amongst us so that we would talk gossip about people who were gossiping. Now, I want to be above it, but I cannot lie because I love Real Housewives franchise. Real Housewives, Orange County, I got to hold it down. It's my hood, right? Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Well, because I want to live in Beverly Hills one day. Real Housewives of Dubai. Well, because I love the Middle East. Real Housewives of Potomac. I just like it. But my favorite, I have my favorite, Real Housewives of Atlanta. Give me NeNe Leaks all day, honey. All day, honey. Yes. The most ratchet franchise. And I love it. I confess my trespasses amongst the brethren, okay? But, but, but I watch the shows while I'm riding my Peloton. So it's like I burn calories and like not a waste of time, right? I'm still holy, still holy. We watch gossip because we love to see people's lives implode. We speak gossip because we want to feel better about ourselves. See, gossip claims I'm strong because you're weak. But the gospel proclaims I'm weak, but my God is strong. So whether we do this intentionally or unintentionally, whether we talk trash and run our mouth and run amok, spreading slander and lies, gossip and guiles, we are causing division we are causing hatred, and three people are hurt in the act of gossip. The one who is speaking the gossip, the one who's being gossiped about, and the one that's listening to the gossip. So gossip hurts everybody. Nobody wins when we gossip. And yes, I say we, because we as the church, we're the chief offenders. Do you know that the reason why the world looks at Christians and says, why would I want to be like you? Is we come into church wearing masks, pretending that we're so holier than thou, like we don't have issues. And we're afraid of telling on ourselves. Yeah. This is my struggle. 
This is what I'm dealing with. This is my failure. This is my flaw. This is my sin. Check out what Proverbs 18, 8 says. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the innermost part. I've invited my, my, my husband to be part of this example, and I have to clarify that this is my husband. But, but Pastor Matt, he has a, a morsel. He has a morsel, a choice morsel. Oh, what's a choice morsel? It is something that's beautiful and delicious. He has this gossip, right? So he's partaking in this gossip, something that he's heard, and he cannot wait. He cannot wait. He's, he's going to be like, I cannot wait to tell Bianca this gossip. Well, I'm excited, and I know that he has gossip, and I'm like, this is a choice morsel that I want. Oh, wow, wow. We look at this, and we are like, this is this choice morsel that is so delicious. And we think that gossip stops here. Gossip doesn't stop here, friends. When we get gossip, we go back. Oh. Mm. Mm. Joyce Marshall. Oh, it's so good. You want to sit there? You want to sit there <coughs> and say, that's so gross. And yet you run your mouth and talk about everyone else? The same disgust and the same disdain, the same crumbs that you see on my mouth, your gossip's all over you. It is all over you. It's sucking your teeth. People can see it. And it makes you different. Dare I say, it makes you sick. It's disgusting. It's wrong. It's harmful. It's assassinating people. And it cannot be in the church. This critical spirit is destroying us. But the number one thing that gossip does, it attacks creation. When we gossip, we attack God's creation. Yeah. Don't turn there. Write this down. 1 Peter 2, starting in verse 4. Peter says this. Peter says this. This is writing to an early church, a young church, much like ours. He said, as you come to him, the living stone, speaking about God, you also, like living stones, are being built built, circle built, into a spiritual house, circle spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, sanctified, set apart. That's holy. You are set apart. You are a spiritual house, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Yeah. Well, what does my boy Paul say? Paul says when he writes to the First Corinthian church, this church was a turn-up church. This church was a hot mess express. It's like our church. You know what I'm saying? A little bit carnal, a little hood, a little holy. We love Jesus. We've got lots of issues. Paul tells them, do you not know? That your bodies are temples yeah. of the Holy Spirit uh -huh, right. who is in you, whom you have received from God. Yeah. So both Peter and Paul are giving us visual examples. Peter says a spiritual house. Paul says a temple. These are spiritual homes where the Spirit of God resides. And when we talk about people, we are dismantling the temple of God. Yeah. Let me make it real plain. We got this building. In the, in the middle of the pandemic. Now, we were the wandering tribe of Israel, right? So pandemic happened. We lost our building. I mean, it was like hot mess express. That's another testimony for another Sunday. But our good God gave us this great building in the middle of pandemic. We were able to take two nickels and rub them together and like renovate it. We still need some help. You can tell by the padding on the wall. Bless God. But well, one day, one day we're going to be all high and tight to the glory of God. But, but we have this miracle building and we waited and we prayed. God was so faithful. God was so good in giving us this building that... I, I, when we got this building, every room I went through and every seat that you're sitting in, I prayed over. In fact, on Sunday mornings, what I like to do as part of my routine, I get here early and I anoint every single chair with anointing oil. And I pray for every single chair and every single piece of technology. Why? Because I want you to encounter the very presence of God. Whether you were in this building and the video experience or watching online, I believe that the spirit of God can meet you right where you are. I love this house. Busted it on a budget. I love God's house. Yes. So bear with me as I'm going through the rows. There's nothing more that annoys me than people who leave their trash behind. This is God's house. Yeah. And also, I'm petty, okay? I see Starbucks cups, and I pick them up and look whose name is on that cup. Because if I know you, we're going to have a little conversation, all right? Your house could be dirty. Your house could be nasty. Not God's house, all right? Not God's house. Amen? But my same, my same tenacity, my same ferocity, my same anger about people messing with the house of God and destroying it, why don't I care about people's temples being destroyed through the act of gossip? Yeah. Now, you might be sitting here thinking like, oh, well, I agree with you. 
That's right. Gossip and slander and guile, that's, that's, that's not good because it's not true. But the information I have, I, I have facts. I got receipts. I got dates. I got the truth. Let me tell you something that Pastor Craig Rochelle said four years ago, and it so left a mark in my mind. He said, everything that is said must be true, but not everything true must be said. Um, I don't see notebooks or pencils out, so I'm going to say that again, all right? You can take a photo of the wall, post it on social media, and tag at Craig Rochelle. That's not my material. He says everything that is said must be true, but not everything that is true must be said. See, it's easy to talk about that sin and her sin and that addiction, something in the past, something far away. But see, this is more than just a mouth issue. Friends, this is a heart issue. That's what we're starting this series. Because the things that we're going to be talking about over the next six weeks, it's not just actions of our hands or actions of our mind. It's actions against humanity that stem from our heart. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew, Matthew 15, 18. But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from where? The heart. And that is what defiles them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual morality, theft, false testimony, slander. It's a heart issue. What is in you will come out of you. Bet. If it's in you, it will come out of you in one way or another. If it's in you, it will come out of you. So we know that gossip destroys. We know that gossip is disgusting. So how do we prevent it? How do we kill gossip from happening? Instead of trying to kill each other with false testimony, why don't we just kill gossip from the beginning? And so I'm going to give you some very tactile, practical principles. Not because I think you can't handle more, but simply for the fact that gossip has so permeated our culture, we don't even realize that we're actually gossiping. It's so part and parcel of our life. We talk about people all the time. Sometimes we do it under the guise of humor. Sometimes we do it under the guise of jealousy. But we do it. Sometimes we do it under the, spa- the, 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 the covering of, well, I'm just telling my spouse about it. No, 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 no. It's embedded in our culture. So the first thing that I want is to write down in, in killing, killing gossip is guard your ears. Guard your ears. Guard your ears. This is where it starts. So excuse me, this is where it starts. As I was studying for this topic, I was reading an article through uh, Psychology Today. Psychology Today is a secular right, it's a secular magazine, and it's dealing with uh, therapists and psychoanalysts and um, psychologists. And I love the title. The title, the, the, the title of the article was How to Stop Gossip in One Question. One question? You're telling me I can stop gossip in one question? So, of course, it piqued my interest. And I was flipping through the article, flipping through the article, reading the research. And what I realized is that you could stop gossip with one question. And do you know what that one question is? Why are you telling me this? Because when we stop, and the article, let me synthesize the article for you. When, you we, when we stop and we ask the person who's telling us this, why are you telling me this? The person who's about to share has to mentally, psychologically stop and say, Why am I telling this person this? It gives us space and place to process. Why are we saying what we're saying? I want to pause for a second. I want to address just the the painful and true facts that there will be times where you are hurt by people, you're marred by people, someone's done something to offend you. That's legitimate. And you feel like you need to process it with somebody. Now, if you need wisdom on how to have a hard conversation, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now the best thing that you can do is will you go to God about it? Because yeah. sometimes we feel like, oh, but you know, God's not going to respond back to me. Why don't you try? Just go to God, pray, seek his word, and see what he says about it and what you think you should do. And if for some reason God's silent, I would encourage you, don't go run your mouth to everybody and the baby mama. What you're going to do is I would encourage you, meet with your counselor about it. If, if a therapist or a counselor is not readily available for you, I would encourage you, find a seasoned saint in the faith. Find an elder of the church that has no dog in the fight, meaning that they don't have a side, they're not going to be biased, and they're also not going to take this information and spread it everywhere. Who's a trusted person that can go and intercede and also give you wisdom that will call you out in areas that maybe you need to be called out on. That's what we do. And then after that, we we have to practice, we'll get into this in a second, what Jesus told people on how to reconcile conflict. If someone's offended you, go to your brother. You tell them. Matthew 18, 15, that's right. Go tell your brother. We'll get to that in a second. But what happens is we go and want to process and we want feedback and we want insight. You have to be careful because you might find the person that is just as discontent and bitter and stir that pot of discontentment with you. That will not help you. That will not heal you. That will actually hurt you. And let me be honest, 
let me be really, really honest. What you permit, you promote. So when people come to you with information and you're that lightning rod, ask yourself why. Because if people feel real safe to bring you all their trash, they might view you as a trash collector. You know what I'm saying? Don't bring me your garbage. That's not, that's not, that's not for me. So what was that question? You simply ask, why are you telling me this? If you're anything like me, um, I, I don't like conflict. I like to avoid it like the plague. So that question, even if you say it gentle and, and tender and sincere, like, why are you telling me this? It still feels a little aggressive to me. So you can use my phrase that I like to use because it feels a little bit softer, a little bit more gentle. It's, have you spoken to them about it? So if they're going to come to me with information, the first question I'm going to ask because I have to protect my ears is, have you spoken to them about it? Let me tell you something, 98% of the time, they haven't. Then it's like case closed, you don't have to worry about it. It's like, go, go handle it, right? But this amazing question of have you spoken to them about it, it actually comes from the most brilliant man, Jesus. And Jesus says in Matthew 18, he's talking about conflict between two people. And he said, listen, go and confront that person privately. Have that conversation. Why? Not just to call them out and make them feel dumb and belittle them. No, the goal is for unification. Hey, you hurt me. Let me tell you why. Let me confront you. Your behavior was not cool. You, the words that you said, the, your word choices, we confront our brethren. Yeah. And then there's unification. The goal is that you could be unified in the family of Christ. That's why we confront the brethren. And when we do that, we get to act and respond like Jesus. The goal is formation. Yes, transformation through what Jesus did, but formation into the likeness and the likelihood of our God. Now, the truth of the matter is, is that you might have a legitimate issue to bring up. Pray about it, seek counsel, and then confront. So I want to make this very practical, very tactical. The first thing that I want us to do, uh, uh, the first thing that I want us to do is to guard our ears. The second thing I want us to do is close our mouth. That's the hard part, close our mouth. Now, some of you are new to faith and have different faith backgrounds, and I get it. Maybe many of you guys don't get into scripture every day. That's the goal. One thing about me is I will jam scripture down your throat, whether you like it or not, because I believe it's life transformation, all right? If somebody's sick and they're refusing to take medicine, I'm be the person that's going to open up their jaws and shove it down. That's what we're doing today. So you don't have to turn there, but I do want you to write this down and memorize this. Proverbs 21, 23 says this, watch your tongue. Keep your mouth shut and you will stay out of trouble. Amen. You're welcome. Thank you, Brother Solomon. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to learn this verse together. The Bible says to watch your tongue, keep your mouth shut, and you'll stay out of trouble. So you're going to help me. I'm going to say a phrase, and then you're going to repeat it. If you're watching online, type it in the chat box. Everyone's going to play. Y'all got a voice. Now, you're going to say, watch your tongue. And then you're going to say, keep your mouth shut. And then you're going to say, stay out of trouble. Let's do it again. Watch your, Watch your tongue. Keep your mouth shut. Your mouth shut. Stay, out Stay out of trouble. Watch your tongue. Watch your tongue. Keep, your shut. Keep your mouth shut. Stay out of trouble. Out of trouble. One more time because we all need it. Watch your tongue. Watch your tongue. Keep, your Keep your mouth shut. Stay out of trouble. Out of trouble. Guess what? Congratulations. You just learned your very first Bible verse. Yes. That's wisdom. That is wisdom. We, some of us really need that verse. I love that verse. So let's think about this proactively because we know the juicy morsels are going to come. We know they're going to be delicious and they're going to slide down and they're going to feel good, but they're going to rot in our stomach. We know those juicy morsels of gospel are coming. So what do we do? We need an action plan. This is what I want us to remember. This will stop. This will stop us in the process when it comes our way. We ask ourselves this question. If I was them, would I want them to talk about me the way that I'm going to talk about them? If I were them, do I want them to talk about me the same way that I'm talking about them? The answer is most likely going to be no. In fact, Jesus says in Luke 6, 31, he says this. He said this to his followers. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So the question I'm asking is, would you say that in front of them? If the answer is no, watch your tongue. Keep your mouth shut and stay away from trouble. You're welcome. I'm saving you drama, okay? And I know this because I'm in a group text message with my uh, closest friends. We've been friends since high school. And we text each other pretty much every day. Well, there was an issue that happened. And uh, uh, what happened was, okay, <laughs> we're in a group thread. And sometimes when one of our friends is being annoying, we'll have like a whole other separate thread. And what happened was I didn't know that one of my friends was in the thread that I was texting about. And she would be real annoying. So I was like, can you believe? And I realized she was in that text message thread. It was so hurtful. 
I felt so stupid. I was immediately called out and I wasn't even called up. My friends don't love Jesus enough. They didn't call me up and say like, you're better than this. They're like, ooh, you got in trouble. <laughs> we have to be careful because gossip hurts the one who gossips, yeah. hurts those who listen, and hurts those that are being spoken about. Yeah. Right. This is dangerous. We're killing people here. We are killing people. So I want this to feel practical and doable. And I think we need to understand that the problem is not just with our mouths. The problem is not just with our brains. The problem is with our heart. See, it's not just the juicy morsel. It's the fact that our heart is sin-stained. Our heart is broken. And what we try to do is make ourselves feel better by making other people look worse. Matthew 12, 34 says this, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So we, th we say things like, oh, he is so arrogant. But the truth of the matter is, is you want his car. We say things like, oh, she is dressed totally like a hoochie, but you're envious of her body. You say things like, oh, he's so cocky, but you really want his bank account. We say things like, oh, they are so arrogant. They're so full of themselves, but really we want their lifestyle. And the truth of the matter is, is we share gossip because if I could talk about her lack of fashion, if I could talk about his social media obsession or their issue with drugs or their issue with weight gain or their issue with their marriage or their issue with the porn habits, then I don't have to talk about mine. And if I could just push somebody down, then I could step up and make myself feel a little bit better. Yeah. See, gossip claims you're weak, so I'm strong. But the gospel says I'm weak, but he is strong. Proverbs 18, 21, let me read that again. The power of the tongue has power of life and of death, and those who, eat, those who love it will eat its fruit. Yeah. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, when we recognize who we are, it actually begins to change our heart. Yeah. That's the goal. When we recognize who we are and the, line, the lens and the filter and the mind of Christ, it changes who we are. When we realize, <laughs> you know what? I am fearfully and wonderfully made, fashioned from my mother's womb, as, as Psalms tells me. I, I know that there's a plan and a purpose for my life, plans of good and not of evil, as the book of Jeremiah tells me. As the book of Ephesians says that I am his workmanship, I'm his masterpiece, I am his poema, that he has a plan for me. The scripture also says that he who started a good work in me is faithful to complete it until the days of Christ. I know who I am. I'm a temple of the living God, the most high God dwells within me. And the moment that I begin to see myself that way, I'm going to see you that way. My heart is being transformed. We are transformed into the nature and the nurture, the likeness of Jesus. And when that happens, I don't have to put others down to make me feel better. Yeah. I can get to the point where I can say, I don't care what people say about me online, that I'm a heretic, that I'm a, out of God's will. I don't have to believe what the media says about me. I don't have to believe what church people say about me. I don't have to believe what disgruntled people say about me. I don't have to believe what my family says about me because I know who I am. And when I know who I am, I'm going to treat you in the way that God sees you. I, I, I get emotional because I, I wonder, instead of being a church that is known for talking trash or a, a church that's known for hypocritis, which is the Greek word for hypocrisy, or a church that's just here for kicks or a show, what if we were a church that was known for talking about each other? but I'm not talking about gossip. What if we were a church that was known for encouraging each other? What if you got caught, not gossipy? Ooh, you got caught encouraging. So we can go up, we can go to each other. <gasps> did, you hear, did you hear what John said about you? What? John's talking about me? What did John say? John says that he is so astounded by your leadership. And you're such a young kid, and yet he sees that you are loving and leading Jesus. I had to tell him, he's talking about you. Oh, no, 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 what about, what about, what about, do you hear what Rachel said? Oh, yeah, you know what Rachel said? Rachel said that she loves how you love God. And she sees the God love in you that's oozing out of your pores. And, and Rachel wants to do the same exact thing. What if we were a church that spoke about each other in the most encouraging way? When we begin to realize who Jesus is, who he was, who he promised he will be, that he's the way, the truth, and the life. And he brings life. And guess what? When we know who Jesus is, our language changes because our heart changes. That's what we want over the next six weeks. We encourage you. Will you go deep with us? Will you have hard conversations with us? Because I believe that over the course of this series, it's not just our mouths that will be transformed or our heart that will be transformed or our mind that will be transformed, but I firmly believe that how we view each other will be transformed. 
that we can be transformed in the likeness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's my heart. That's my hope. And so I want to, I just want to, I'm going to ask for us to be real. See, because it's one thing to take in information, but when information is not applied, it's just dead. But when information is applied, it becomes transformation. And so I know that there's people in here who have spoken mad trash about people. And it's high time that we need to do Matthew 18, 15. If we're going to love as a community, if we're going to change as a community, we're going to grow as a community, we've got to be willing to have hard conversations with people. And we don't do it to attack them. We do it out of love. I just, I I, I love you. And I I wouldn't want you to do this to someone else because it hurt me in this way. And and so right now, I'm just going to pray a prayer for our online community, this family. We're, we're one church online here in another room, whatever. We're one church. So I'm going to pray a prayer for our community that we begin to love like Jesus, not be afraid of conflict, and kill gossip at the outset, to guard our ears, to watch our mouth, to stay away from evil. Heavenly Father, we come before you. I pray for every person in here that needs to do business. May we not let the enemy just think it's not that big of a deal or we just ask for forgiveness and then we move on. May we not sweep it under the carpet, but may we love our brothers and sisters, biological and spiritual, to have conversations of transformation, development, and growth. You're going to be the thing that's going to change our community, the Capital C Church, and our lives as individuals. Thank you, Jesus. With every head bowed and every eye closed every Sunday, We love to make room for the God of transformation. Transformation in your life can't take place. Formation in your life can't take place unless you have a relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if you're here today and you've never said yes to Jesus, or maybe you haven't been in church for a minute and you know that your word choices, your lifestyle, your actions are so far from the things of God, this is what we want to do in this moment. We're going to invite you, whether for the first time or coming back to faith, to have Jesus transform your life through a confession of saying, I'm desperate for you, Jesus. I need you in my life. I choose to serve you. I'm going to count to three. And when I count to three, I'm inviting you to raise your hand to declare that you want Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Online, in the video experience, and in this room, one, by raising your hand, you are saying, I want Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. I want him to rule my life. Two, my mistakes and my, my failures. But the, the Bible refers to as sin, that, that that can be removed because of what Jesus did on the cross on Calvary. And three, as Romans says, the same spirit that resurrected Jesus from the grave is alive in me. If that is you, and you are saying yes to Jesus. One, two, three. Will you shoot your hands up nice and high so I can see them? God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Amazing, in the video experience, there's someone that can see your hand. Anyone else, before we close up, anyone online, put a hand in the emoji, put an emoji in the chat box. There's people that can see you. That's what we're gonna do. Church, I'm going to invite us to all stand to our feet because we're standing as a community with those that said yes to Jesus. And I'm inviting you to repeat after me to let those that are coming back to faith or saying yes to Jesus for the first time, but they're not alone. No one's alone in this family of Christ. Will you boldly repeat after me and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today I choose you as my Lord and Savior. Cleanse my heart. Cleanse my mind. Cleanse my conscience. Fill me with your spirit to do what I cannot do. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can we celebrate, church? Now we're gonna close it out. We're gonna put a bow on it today and we're gonna worship God. We confess our trespasses right now. If you need to do business, pray with the Lord, yes. But we're gonna worship God and give him the honor that he's due. Amen.